ABCDE assessment of the deteriorating or collapsed patient begins with systematic evaluation of the patency of the airway and the adequacy of respiratory effort. If these are found to be inadequate, basic manoeuvres and airway adjuncts should be used to support A and B while waiting for further assistance. Oxygen saturation monitoring is a useful tool to aid this assessment, but treatment should not be delayed while this is sought. Cyanosis is a late sign of hypoxia and may not be a visible sign until saturations are well below 90%. Unconscious adults in a hospital bed in a semi-recumbent position or sat in a chair are likely to have an obstructed airway due to loss of pharyngeal tone and the head tipping forward. Unconscious adults lying flat on their back are likely to have an obstructed airway due to loss of pharyngeal tone and the tongue slipping backwards, partially or completely obstructing the laryngeal inlet. On assessment, there may be indications of airway obstruction represented by audible sounds. A noisy airway is an obstructed airway, but an obstructed airway is not always noisy, and complete silence on assessment is indicative of complete obstruction. Wheezing sounds originate from the lower airways within the lungs themselves. Stridor presents as a crowing noise, usually on inspiration, and originates from the level of the larynx. These sounds require careful assessment and treatment of the underlying cause. Gurgling or snoring are indicative of upper airway obstruction and indicate liquid or semi-liquid obstruction in the case of gurgling and loss of muscle tone in the upper airways around the soft palate in the case of snoring. Where the presence of liquid or semi-liquid obstruction is suspected, suctioning should be used to clear the airway. The suction equipment in the bed space should be checked and ready to use at all times, or a portable suction unit can be brought to a patient found in a location without access to this equipment. The suction regulator should be turned up to a level that will effectively suction the material from the airway. The semi-rigid Yankauer suction catheter should be inserted into the open airway, keeping the tip in view at all times, avoiding trauma to the soft tissues of the airway, and avoiding stimulating the tonsil beds, which may provoke a gag reflex. Copious liquid in the airway, such as vomit, can be removed rapidly by tilting the patient to one side. You may need assistance to carry out this safely. The full force of the suction equipment is activated by occluding the circular opening on the Yankau catheter. Suction should be applied for the minimum time required to clear the obstruction. If the obstruction cannot be relieved by suctioning, or solid, semi-solid or foreign object obstruction is suspected at a level below the tongue, ensure expert help is summoned urgently. Once any material obstructing the airway has been cleared, airway management begins by aligning the anatomical structures using the head tilt chin lift or jaw thrust manoeuvre. The patient needs to be safely placed flat on their back, on the bed or on the floor and any pillows removed to aid assessment. The head tilt chin lift is achieved by placing the fingers of one hand on the patient's forehead and the fingers of the other hand under the patient's chin, extending the patient's neck. This pulls the anatomical structures in the neck up and forward and if the tongue is obstructing the opening to the airway it will be pulled away making the airway patent. Because this manoeuvre involves extension of the cervical spine, it is not safe to perform when the patient's history or suspected mechanism of injury leads to a reasonable suspicion of C-spine fracture. Manipulating this fracture may lead to it becoming destabilised, causing further harm or serious injury. Such circumstances may include road traffic accidents, assault from the shoulders up, witness fall from height onto the head and shoulders, suspension injury, for example, from a ligature. In these cases, it is safer to use the jaw thrust manoeuvre, placing two fingers under the corner of the patient's jaw and pushing the jaw vertically up towards the ceiling. If more force or leverage is needed, the muscles at the base of each thumb can be placed on the cheekbones. This must therefore be used with caution in patients with known or suspected facial fractures, with special care taken to avoid extending or flexing the neck. These manoeuvres both provide excellent airway opening but can be supplemented with airway adjuncts depending on the skills and experience of the practitioners and the condition of the patient. Safe use of simple adjuncts like oro or nasopharyngeal airways or advanced airway adjuncts like an eye gel device may help improve patency and stability of the airway. 
supporting ventilation using a bag valve mask device and allowing further assessments and treatment. The oropharyngeal, also known as an OPA or Goodell airway, is a small curved tube that is inserted into the mouth and prevents the tongue falling back and obstructing the entrance to the trachea. The OPA is colour coded by size for easy reference, but still needs to be sized using a simple assessment to ensure good fit. The airway is placed along the unconscious patient's face and the length assessed from the corner of the jaw to the level of the incisor. A well-fitted airway will conform roughly to this length, with one slightly too large being preferable to one slightly too small. An airway that is too small will not keep the tongue from falling back. If the measurement appears to fall between two sizes, favour the larger size. With a head tilt chin lift employed, the correctly sized OPA is introduced with the curve pointing towards the patient's head and inserted along the hard palate until resistance is felt. At this point, the airway is rotated 180 degrees until it slides over the back of the tongue. The head tilt chin lift can then be relaxed and the patency of the airway assessed. The OPA is well tolerated by the unconscious patient. If the patient resists, coughs or gags during insertion of the OPA, or on reassessment appears to be spontaneously rejecting the device, it should be removed. Under no circumstances should force be applied to an OPA to keep it in place. The nasopharyngeal, or NP airway, is another adjunct that can be used to assist with basic airway management. It is a simple silicon tube with a bevel at one end and a flange at the other. It is well tolerated in semi-conscious patients. The device should be used with caution in patients with head injury where base of skull fracture has not been excluded, nasal and frontal face injuries and fractures, coagulopathy, recent nasal surgery and known nasal abnormalities such as a deviated septum and large nasal polyps. Sizes 6 and 7 are suitable for most adult patients. Sizing the device can be performed by a simple visual assessment, selecting the largest NP airway that will fit the patient's nostril without blanching the capillary bed. Measuring the device against the side of the patient's face using the distance between the tip of the nose and the tragus of the ear also gives an indication of the correct size to be used. The NPA is lubricated, taking care not to occlude the lumen with a plug of lubrication gel and carefully inserted from the nasal opening up into the nostril. When a sufficient length has been passed to have cleared the nostril, the airway is then inserted vertically back into the nasopharynx. Some resistance may be experienced on insertion. If gentle side-to-side -side rotation of the device cannot overcome this problem, insertion into the other nostril should be attempted. If resistance is still encountered, reassessment and alternative adjuncts may be considered. The device has a slight curve to it, reflecting the anatomy of the nasal airway. This alignment should be maintained at all times. At no time should the device be corkscrewed or rotated 360 degrees as this carries an increased risk of trauma to the nasal wall and the nasal turbinates. A small amount of trauma and bleeding may be evident after insertion. This should be assessed and observed to ensure that no serious injury has occurred. Patients with a low respiratory rate or who have depressed consciousness and airway obstruction will almost certainly require supported ventilation, provided initially with a bag valve mask device. The device can be used without an oxygen supply to ventilate the patient with room air, but a supply of oxygen should be obtained and attached immediately and turned up to deliver 15 litres per minute. A two-person technique is used by all non-expert practitioners, one rescuer holding the mask, the other squeezing the bag. The rescuer holding the mask should locate themselves at the patient's head or as close as possible to it. Consider moving mobile beds away from the wall and removing a headboard if possible, or moving the patient safely and with assistance if required. The mask is placed over the patient's face with a narrow part over the nose and the wide part between the bottom lip and the chin. The rescuer's thumbs are placed on the hard upper part of the mask either side of the collar, pointing at the patient's toes. The other fingers grasp the jaw firmly. A good seal can be achieved by pressing the mask down and lifting the jaw up. Ventilation is achieved by a second rescuer squeezing the reservoir firmly with thumb and forefinger. Excessive volume should be avoided and care taken not to hyperventilate the patient. Ventilations that visibly move the chest are adequate and the chest should be allowed to relax passively in between breaths. A respiratory rate of 12 to 14 per minute should be provided, reassessing after every minute. 
After a prolonged period of depressed consciousness, airway management and ventilatory support, it may be appropriate to consider an advanced airway such as an eye gel, depending on the skills and competence of the practitioners managing the emergency. The eye gel is a supraglottic airway device. This means that the device sits above the vocal cords and will keep the airway structures open but will not protect the lungs from aspirating gastric contents in the event of vomiting or regurgitation. Ensure airway management and appropriate ventilation continues whilst the device is unpacked and prepared. Eye gel sizes 3, 4 and 5 will support ventilation in almost all adults. The devices are colour coded according to size and are selected based on an approximation of the patient's weight. A size 4 green eye gel will be suitable for the majority of patients in the range of 50 to 90 kilograms. The yellow size 3 is suitable for patients below this weight group and an orange size 5 for patients heavier than 90 kilograms. The device has a gel filled cuff that sits over the laryngeal inlet. The gel in the device changes its shape as the device warms up once inserted into the airway. This feature means that a small leak should improve after a few minutes of use as the device conforms to the anatomy. Above the cuff, the device has a bite block so the patients cannot obstruct the airway by biting. A black line indicates the maximum depth of insertion. The top of the device connects to the bag valve device once the mask is removed. To insert the device, place some of the lubricant gel from the sachet included in the pack onto the hard plastic part of the packaging. Lubricate the rear surface of the device. With the patient's airway open, hold the eye gel like a pen and insert it along the back of the patient's throat, applying a reasonable amount of force to proceed past the back of the tongue. If you have an assistant, they can help you keep the airway open and retract the jaw to aid insertion. Once the device is inserted, relax any airway positioning, attach the bag valve device to the connector and attempt ventilation. If the device provides a sufficiently good seal, immediately secure it with the strap included. If the device has a large leak, briefly attempt to insert it deeper with gentle pressure, observing the maximum depth line. Try not to let the device rotate or migrate to one side of the mouth. If the leak does not reasonably improve with repositioning and is not providing adequate ventilation, consider removing the device and returning to a combination of techniques and adjuncts that previously worked well and reassess ensuring expert help is on the way. Multiple prolonged attempts at reinsertion traumatise the airway, complicating further management and distract rescuers from administering adequate ventilation and oxygenation. Additional features of the eye gel recess pack include a gastric aspiration catheter and a supplementary oxygen port. If the patient deteriorates and has a cardiac arrest, exhaled carbon dioxide is a measure that helps determine the adequacy and efficiency of chest compressions. As carbon dioxide is produced by cellular respiration before exhalation, this monitoring demonstrates a return of spontaneous circulation when carbon dioxide is produced by the patient independent of ventilations and chest compressions. This is seen as a rise in the exhaled carbon dioxide measurement on the monitor. In summary, ensure expert help is summoned urgently. Open the airway using simple manoeuvres. If there is liquid or semi-liquid material in the airway, use suction equipment to clear it. Patients with depressed level of consciousness are at risk of being unable to maintain a patent airway or an adequate respiratory rate. Consider the use of simple adjuncts such as oropharyngeal or nasopharyngeal airways. Use a bag valve mask device with two-handed seal and firm ventilation to support an inadequate respiratory rate. If supporting ventilation for a prolonged period of time, consider the use of an eye gel device. End tidal carbon dioxide measurement should be used as rapidly as possible to enable assessment of ventilation and respiration. At all times assess and reassess all manoeuvres and adjuncts for efficacy. If they do not appear to be providing the support required, return to the last combination that did work and reassess. If the interventions performed to support A and B are working, proceed with the rest of the ABCDE assessment and hand over your findings to the emergency team as they arrive.